Well, welcome everyone to our, let's see here, our April 2024 Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. It's always a mouthful. Before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Market Special Interest Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support and making this group possible. We do have, I'm real excited about having Karen Kilroy and I believe Orson Weems, uh, who's gonna be talking about uh, their book, um, uh, Blockchain Tethered AI, excuse me. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. Okay. Um, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussion of company specific products, pricing and projects. We don't make negative remarks uh, about other companies or their products. And the code of conduct states that we treat each other with respect. We don't discriminate and we communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. So everyone's welcome to our meetings, and this is intended to be an open forum for sharing ideas and having constructive uh, discussions. But if you want to lurk, and please lurk. We'd also like to express our appreciation to our Hyperledger members, and this slide shows the premier and general members as well. You can see that it's a growing list. If you're new, Welcome, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the comments. Uh, and if there's anything specifically that you want, you're interested in, just go ahead and share that in the comments. Uh, but again, lurkers are welcome. Here's our agenda for today. We've gone through the introduction of the antitrust code of conduct that's always required with our Hyperledger meetings. Uh, we'll go through some Hyperledger community slides. Uh, James will go through the status of blockchain in the mortgage industry, and then Karen, I'll hand it off to you to uh, walk through blockchain tethered AI, uh, give us a background on you and Orson, overview of the book, and, and then discussion of any applicability for financial services, or um, you're in charge of the agenda at that point. So if you want to wax poetic, feel free. <laughs> okay. We always cover this slide in each of our meetings, and this is to reinforce we're all on the same blockchain journey. We just may be at different paths, different points along that path. This group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through the mortgage industry use cases and define potential implementation paths. 2023 was a rough year for blockchain with the crypto winner and that impacted us. And now I think we're coming back. So I'm real excited about it. The next several slides I always mention, and I'll go through those pretty quickly. This slide provides the different resources uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Linux Foundation, Hyperledger. Uh, the second from the bottom is the link to our group wiki. Please feel free to take a look at that because it contains our meeting notes from previous uh, uh, meetings, our recordings, and curated articles about blockchain in the mortgage industry. And we're up to over several hundred, and James will talk about that as well. If you want access to these resources, you will need an LFID, and this will walk you through it. I'm not going to go over it, but click on the link and you can see the video. Hyperledger certification, highly encourage this as well. Uh, and then blockchain training. I always mention this because this is how I learned about blockchain, at least from the Linux Foundation. Excellent training, very worthwhile. And one of my favorite words, free. Okay, I was mentioning this at the beginning. I invite everyone that's in Southern California that's available on Friday afternoon to attend this Embracing AI Summit. It's free at UCLA, 1 to 4.30, and then a reception afterwards. There's a link in the chat to go to this, so definitely feel free and join. And if you go to that and you see me, come introduce yourself. With that, I'm going to hand it over to James. You're on mute. I just realized that. <laughs> Thank you, Marvin, and welcome everybody to the April presentation. Um, I've got a few articles and information that I want to share with you guys before our main presentation today. So, Marvin, let's jump right into it on the next slide. 
So one of the first articles I wanted to bring you comes out of Tech Funnel. So this article starts with a traditional overview and current state of blockchain in our industry. You know, heavy reliance on paper documentation, long turn times, and how blockchain can benefit those. It really delves into three fintech systems driving mortgage transformation in 2024. So the role of data analytics in fintech lending and how fintech platforms leverage sophisticated data algorithms to analyze extensive data sets. And this allows lenders to offer borrowers customized offers based on their needs. They talk about you know blockchain and smart contracts, the, the traditional conversations that we've had. And then it really goes into the impact of AI and machine learning, how applying AI and ML to structured and unstructured data sets and through pattern recognition techniques, it can create actionable insights and predictable outcomes. Um, for instance, research, research has shown that AI can predict loan acceptance possibilities with 85% accuracy, and in the servicing environment can predict loan default possibilities with a 75% accuracy. Ultimately, the article finishes up with noting the mortgage industry is yet to achieve end-to-end -end technology driven operations at par with native fintech platforms. And mortgage lenders really need to focus on investing this year in superior data quality, API frameworks, because they serve as the backbone for interoperability and integration between mortgage systems and fintech solutions. Compliance automation, implementing automated solutions such as rule engines, uh, reg reporting, AI platforms, continuous monitoring adherence. And then, you know, cybersecurity, it's always top of mind. So, you know, great article worth checking out to see what they're kind of predicting for this year in the industry. Uh, moving on to the next slide article, or <laughs> the next slide, Marvin. Um, so looking at how te blockchain technology is having an impact in real estate. So this is by DebtSoft, and it opens up talking about how the real estate industry has a compounded annual growth rate of around 66.27%. The trend is expected to grow at the same at the same compounded annual growth rate till at least 2027. And it's estimated that almost 50% of all transactions could be happening via blockchain as early as the end of next year. So the article provides examples of how can blockchain be used in real estate. It covers topics from real estate tokenization, loan and mortgage security, urban planning, pre-calculated pre property valuations, as well as investment background checks and land and property registry and sales, which that's actually a topic that we've talked about last year as well. It continues with discussing the traditional benefits of blockchain, transparency, efficiency, accessibility, and ultimately has an FAQ on asset tokenization, blockchain in commercial lending, and crypto in the real estate industry, which is actually the next article I want to want to touch on, if you don't mind moving to the next slide, or, or Marvin. So, you know, in the past, we have talked about crypto-backed uh, mortgage loans in particular, and, you know, 2022 and early 23, we've talked about them quite a bit. I just wanted to bring you guys an update on what we're kind of seeing in that market. Um, so crypto back mortgage, for those that you don't know it, it's really an agreement where it requires the borrower deposit cryptocurrency as collateral to guarantee repayment of a mortgage. It starts with finding a DeFi lender that accepts cryptocurrency as collateral. Borrowers determine how much can be borrowed, or excuse me, borrowers must prove ownership of the digital assets to be used as security. And then the lenders determine how much can be borrowed based on available collateral. Loan value may also consider factors such as volatility of the crypto price markets um, or the target property itself. The borrower pays back uh, when the borrower pays the loan back, the collateral is returned to them at the end of the loan term. And if the loan goes into default per the loan agreement, lenders will be able to claim part or all of the collateral to cover the value of that default. And the assets in turn may be liquidated. 
So that's kind of the overview that we've talked about before. This article covers all those things, but then it really it talks about the types of crypto back mortgages that we're seeing today. And, you know, it used to be we were just seeing them for uh, an initial home purchase, but now we're seeing them for home purchases. We're seeing them for refinances or what they're calling remortgaging, um, where the existing homeowner is providing now cryptocurrencies as collateral against a loan on a property that they already own. And then we're also starting to see crypto loans now in bridging loans. These are used for interim financing when a borrower needs to finalize the purchase of a new property for a period of time until the proceeds from the sales of an existing property are credited. So we're actually starting to see new creative solutions being implemented with crypto mortgages. And finally, it discusses the, the benefits and risk related to these types of funding instruments. Um, the next article we have is from Tech Times. It's talking about how tech is uh, shaping up the mortgage industry. The article opens with McKinsey and, Co or McKinsey and Company reports that approximately 60% of borrowers are open to completing their mortgage applications online nowadays. And this is for both new homes as well as refinancing. Borrowers are increasingly seeking an efficient, convenient, and streamlined mortgage process. And the article discusses the use of APIs, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning um, applications in the mortgage or the mortgage industry. API adoption, you know, again, as we talked, really increases efficiency, ensures data accuracy, automates all that workflow, and facilitates compliance with U.S. mortgage re regulations. While uh, AI can train systems to perform cogn cognitive tax tasks such as recommending approval or denial decisions, classifying information. Institutions can use these in every step of the lending process to produce, reduce cost as well as the turn time. And then it also talks about blockchain, how, secu how the secure digital ledger works, um, how each blockchain contains a list of transactions that can't be altered, you know, yada, 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 the immutable record, um, the traditional things that we hear out of blockchain be benefits. Ultimately, this article does circle back to what we started with in our articles today and the discussion of the benefits on fintech collaboration. And then the next slide, Marvin. This is the last one I wanted to share while I was uh, researching for various articles and what's going on in the industry. I'm always excited when we see the government institutions, the GSEs getting involved with blockchain or AI. And I actually did stumble across this. So FHFA is housing an event this summer called Generate Generative Artificial Intelligence and Housing Finance Tech Sprint. Uh, there's a mouthful for you too, Marvin. Taking place at uh, FHA, FHFA's Constitution Center headquarters in Washington, D.C., the event's going to be going on from July 22nd to July 25th this year. Applications to participate, though, are due by May 24th, um, and you can find information. We've actually got this on our wiki page. You'll be able to click to the link from there. FHFA describes the event as inviting all interested individuals to submit an application to participate in the tech sprint. Teams will be assembled into functional groups with diverse expertise and experience, including participants from fields such as housing finance, consumer financial services, technology risks, and compliance. The focus, you'll see it there at the bottom. How might the responsible use of generative AI promote a transparent, fair, equitable, and inclusive housing finance system while fostering sustainable ownership and rental opportunities. Tech Sprint participants will be demonstrating a key use for generative AI in one of the four areas of focus. Those four areas include consumer experience, assessing credit worthiness, operations, and risk management and compliance. And in their process, they'll they'll need to recommend control measures, incorporating careful consideration of the associated risks. So as I mentioned, there is a link to this. Um, one of the nice things, though, if you follow the link, you can participate virtually as an observer, not as part of one of the, the teams. But if you go into the link, um, you'll see an apply today. When you go to apply today, there's uh, two options. There's a participant option and an observer option, which is a virtual option. I've actually enrolled myself for that. 
Um, you don't get to attend the entire three days, but you do get to attend the opening and you do get to attend the uh, team presentations at the end as well. And Marvin, over to our my last slide. So this is our Hyperledger Wiki for the mortgage industry subgroup. We always bring this up each month. Um, in the upper right, you'll see the LFID information that uh, Marvin referred to earlier. There's a great little couple minute video there that shows you exactly how to do it. All of the articles that we've talked about today are on the right hand side, including that link to the FHFA um, tech sprint. Over on the left-hand side, you've got uh, the navigation pages. You've also got links into all of our previous presentations since 2021. We've also got um, all of our previous articles and in industry research that we've presented over there. So there's probably roughly about 120, 150 articles that are directly available on the site. But in the background, we've curated well over 300 articles over the last uh, three years now. So if you're looking for additional information, feel free to reach out. And Alma dropped into the chat the link there that you see for the wiki. So highly encourage you guys, come check out the wiki. Sign up for an LFID. As you do, you'll get notifications when we make updates to the wiki. You'll also get notifications for these future presentations as well. And Marvin, that wraps me up. I'll pass it back over to you for introduction of uh, our guest speakers. Thanks, James. That's always exciting information. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Karen Kilroy, our, our speaker today. Karen is a moderator of the Blockchain AI Roundtable, which was established under the Hyperledger Media Entertainment SIG and shared by Brett Russell. Karen is also the founder of File Baby and also a contributor to C2PA Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity and Adobe Lead Initiative under the Linux Foundation. We're really honored to have you join us, uh, Karen. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Will I be able to share my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Boy, thank you so much, Marvin. I really appreciate uh, the invitation here. And it says I need to wait until you stop uh, sharing. There we there go. You know. And I'd also like to present my colleague, introduce my colleague here, Orson Weems, uh, who is president of File Baby. Um, that is my current focus. And uh, he is going to uh, co-present with me. And uh, we, we got this fortunate uh, occurrence because my internet is having trouble today. So as the fickle finger of fate would have it, we have the privilege of having Orson with us. Welcome Orson. Yeah, thank you. Just can you hear us, Orson? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the first thing I want to uh, talk about is the state of work in the AI economy, and uh, it's not good news. Um, we were promised uh, jobs uh, that aren't coming uh, because you know the the whole the There'll be new jobs, there'll be new jobs, there'll be new jobs. Well, there's going to be like maybe one job for every 50 jobs, you know, so those are going to be the new jobs. And a good example of this would be in the, um, in the uh, uh, U.S. Homeland Security has just uh, put out a directive. They're hiring 50 uh, chief artificial intelligence officers. And while they're not saying it, you know, the writing is on the wall for this type of a thing, that what's going to happen is the, the functions of the people themselves, how we usually automate workflow. Well, now we're also building the people that are the steps and the workflow. And um, that's just a fact of the matter. That is just the way it's being uh, done. And it's across the board and it's everywhere. And um, right now we're kind of to the to the state where a lot of CEOs say, well, I, I don't know if we're bringing in AI. It's like, I laugh. I wonder how long they're going to be there um, because they look at the fattest salaries to cut first. And, uh, and so uh, what's happening though instead is it's coming in from the bottom up. And, uh, and, and by that, I mean that every single tool that anyone uses now has a, um, a co-intelligence built into it. 
that makes the person who leverages that, you know, five to 50 times more powerful than they were a few minutes ago. And all of this is, is it's snowballing. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And like to the point where I wait until the day before to uh, do my presentation at all. Like this one I did this morning because you just can't, uh, you just can't uh, do it any sooner because it's changing that fast. And, uh, and one of the things that occurred to me this morning is, well, the, the way that people are going to survive, which I've thought about this for, for a long time since I, since I wrote my book, uh, Blockchain Tethered AI, and I met Orson at the, at the uh, Fitville Public Library Center for Innovation when I was presenting about this very topic. And it just seems like a million years ago now, even though it was, what, just a, a year ago. And, and what we were talking about is, okay, you know, knowing this is what's happening all the all the jobs that were done by people are now going to be done by ai and the knowledge of the people is just being absorbed and the people aren't getting paid you know what's going to happen you know so what what we decided is, is we have to have a way to make sure people get paid for their training data and that gap there i would say in the in the meat grinder funnel is you know what we have to watch you know, where is where is this all going where where is ai uh, and, and back the other way, when you get output from AI, where is that coming from? And one of the links that I put uh, from one of my writings in the, I put it in the chat, uh, it's uh, AI's opaque box is really a supply chain. And I recommend everybody read that um, because that lets you know like the steps of AI because it seems like some big mystery that now all of a sudden you have a co-intelligence that can make you far more powerful than you were a few minutes ago. But it's not, it's not uh, uh, mysterious because it's, it's just hidden from us. So please, please read that article uh, when you uh, have a chance. Now with this, as you can imagine, the sharks are starting to circle. Um, the the you know as traditional in our economy, um, it seems like you know people take a bite, take a bite, take a bite, take a bite until there's nothing left for human beings to live on. And and you know they keep taking the bites. There's you know the first layer takes the bites. Well, they're smart. They know that you got to leave enough for somebody to live on. But then there's you know. Per piranha after piranha after piranha nibbling away at people until there's less than nothing left and they end up on the street they end up in a parking lot in a walmart parking lot living out of their car and we just got to say enough that we're not going to let this happen and we're not, not going to let the new set of sharks uh prey or or piranhas prey on the new paradigm of work uh which is going to be primarily gig gig economy uh, for train in exchange for training data, because the the reason that this data has to stay fresh with human knowledge um, is because if it doesn't, if it's not freshened up all the time, it collapses upon itself. Um, so you, you the models, the AI collapses upon itself. So it has to have fresh meat, if you will. And and so the group that I'm addressing today, um, and the Orson. Um, it, you know, this is so important because you're in a position to make it public if someone starts, if the piranhas start nibbling away at this uh, through, through a, a public uh, finance blockchain where uh, this type of event is recorded in a tamper evident at ledger. So we're going to kind of dig down in how that could happen and why it's not a pipe dream at all. This could happen quickly. And Orson, would you like to add anything to that? I Orson, can't hear. you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, what, we're, what we're talking about is addressing what I think was just said in the previous presentation is how we can make this where it is tamper evident so that there is a traceability, if you will. And I wanted to just uh, mention and talk about why we think uh, the, the authentic content is so important. And uh, some of the, the, the substandard or the standards group that we sit on are the, the C2PA as well as the content uh, authenticity initiative. And the, these things are so important because we don't need people or as, as I like to say, the bad actors coming in to address or to even take or manipulate anything that can be used lies for the 
the, the consumers that can help the consumers and dealing with uh, this mortgage uh, industry and the fintech. I mean, what Aaron is saying is just vital for us to get on top of it right now. And we're going to talk about some of the things that can help that with uh, the way that blockchain and the tethered AI can address that. Thank you. Thank you, Orson. And th there's ways now to tell whether content is authentic. And one of the links that I put in the chat was to C2PA. Uh, and what you can, that's a, that's a coalition uh, for content provenance and authenticity. And it's not anything that happened yesterday and it wasn't even created for AI. Um, what C2PA was created for was to combat fake news. And so this group of leaders has been around for maybe uh, five years now, uh, crafting a set of guidelines to make sure that when you see a piece of content as a consumer of that content, you can backtrace the provenance and see its authenticity. And you can go so far as to see a hash or a fingerprint of the original contents to make sure that nothing has been tampered with. It stops short of blockchain, stop short of blockchain, and they call it blockchain ready. So, so this is a tremendous opportunity for anybody who already is in the blockchain business uh, to, to learn about content credentials and, and be able to uh, connect with that. And even uh, File Baby, our product, which is a platform for content credentials, we don't, uh, we don't, uh, we're not married to any uh, particular blockchain implementation. We prefer Hyperledger Fabric, but we welcome uh, other, other blockchain implementations so we can connect your blockchain customers to this content provenance and authenticity platform uh, with no problem. So, but what you can do with this, in addition to like a fingerprint uh, that that makes the the item tamper evident, and and this uh, it it also has like a history, and a, and a, and a, um, a history of the file, like a uh, the ingredients that created that file. So if, if it was generated by AI, like generated by Microsoft responsible AI, for instance, it says that in there, and it already says that these these credentials are embedded in the files, and most people do not know it. And, and so, uh, and I'll say it again, they're already in there and most people do not know it. And OpenAI is another uh, member of C2PA. If you generate an image through DALI, these content credentials are already in there. Uh, if you save a file in Photoshop, you have the opportunity to save the, the content credentials. And it's on and on and on and on. Uh, BBC just a couple of weeks ago released a, a video news verifier. So when, if you're watching a video, you can dig in and, and find the content credentials. Uh, and, um, and so that is like the, um, the, almost like the consumer facing end of what I would call blockchain tethered AI, which was my project that I worked on for so many years. And I'll get on to that in a minute, but let, let me uh, have Orson chime in on this topic uh, because I'm sure there's many things I didn't tell you. Can't hear you, Orson. I'm sorry, forget that while you're talking. I just can't be, be, what we're talking about are the what the uh, content authenticity initiative has. And I'm getting us some message in my where I'm sitting in my seminar room. One, one moment. Just a so one thing that Orson will probably talk about is how with uh, C2PA uh, you can declare a file as do not use by AI. Right. And so if you have a piece of training data, go ahead and take it out from here, Orson, if you're you know, ready. If you have a piece of training data, what we can do is I like to call it the, the, the DNA of that file. We actually embed that with, and, and that file can be designated and we know the provenance and the authenticity of when and where and the who and the how of that. So uh, Karen, I think what you were saying about the content credentials is really embedded in that makes a lot a lot of way for the, the way that this can show that who owns it and when it was created. Yes. And so we tell if we can tell something not to be used by AI, which is already established and and we we then we then we should be able to tell somebody something that if you use this for AI, 
pay this person. And we're very close to that right now. Um, we've already proven that you can, uh, we've proven the, the claim that uh, it can be, um, that, that, a, that a claim do not use by AI works. Um, a few months ago, uh, we hired uh, Scott Harris, who's as an executive project manager. Um, uh, he sent, and when I was in a hurry to get a press release done, I said, Scott, I need, a, I need your picture. And he sent me one that was postage stamp size. And anybody who's ever done a press release knows you can't do anything with that. So I thought, let me see what I can do. Maybe I can um, use Firefly to make it better, right? I was in a hurry. So I dropped it in. It put his face on a statue. It put his face on the Mona Lisa. I mean, it, put, it was putting his face on everything. And I was, I was freaking out because this guy is 38 years out of IBM. I thought, oh my God, what did I do? I clicked it and shut it. And then, uh, but I noticed while it was pulling the picture in that it uh, said it was checking for content credentials. None found came in. So then I thought, well, let me check Ethan Keel, who is a senior data scientist from Walmart, who works with us part time. And I said, let's let's check uh, Ethan because his picture we we've claimed it in File Baby. It says do not use this AI uh, training data, and so let's see what happens. So I dropped in Ethan's picture, and it it said uh, this says do not use by AI. I'm I'm rejecting it. Can't use it. So it works, and uh, and so as more people sign on to C2PA and and the and the other. Uh, organization that's a broader organization, which is uh, contentauthenticity.org, which I don't think I have in the chat. Um, but that's more of like a, um, like if you if you have a website and you wanna say that you uh, implement, uh, uh, implement the C2PA credentials, you'd sign up for content authenticity and you would get some banners and things like that and it would declare your participation. And that's a much broader group. Um, the C2PA, we're the work, working groups that, uh, we narrow down the actual issues and then we define how to fix them and or how to address them and then we make standards and then tooling is created out of that. So that's that's the C2PA uh, level. But anyway, let's go on. Um, what about blockchain? Well, well, well. You know, I don't have to tell this group what blockchain is, and I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you what enterprise blockchain is. Um, blockchain is really, really important for AI. And um, this is a concept that I worked on since two, let's see, 2016. 2016 is when I started. And, um, and the, um, the way that I got started with blockchain tethered AI is in addition to being a full stack uh, software engineer, I'm also a dragon boat coach. And if anybody knows what a dragon boat coach, what a dragon boat is, and if you don't, it's a it's a 41 foot long boat with a dragon head and a dragon tail, and then there's 20 paddlers that sit facing uh, they sit facing the front, side by side in rows of two, and then there's a drummer that faces them. That, that keeps the beat. And then my job as the coach is, is, is to steer the boat. I stand on the back and steer this 41 foot long boat with a, uh, with a 12 foot uh, long steering oar and we race. And it, but that's dragon boat. And uh, I had the opportunity when I lived in Austin, Texas to uh, coach a team from the Texas School for, blind, for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the boat. And by the way, they won their race because nobody thought they would win and they, and they uh, didn't take it seriously, but the kids got medals, it was fantastic. Uh, but they worked for months, 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 months to get there. And, uh, and they, uh, while they were working, I noticed that every time they, uh, they uh, stopped for a break, right? These are teenagers, now older teenagers, like 18 to 22 they'd get the phones out and they'd get the headsets on and they would just be like every other teenager, you know, flip, flip, you know, whatever they're doing, playing games. And they, they taught me all about the stuff they're doing. And while I was doing, working with them, I thought, you know, it would be great. And this is when the visual recognition was just starting. I thought it'd be great if you could take your phone 
and point it at something and it would tell you, oh, well, there's your caretaker over there. You know, you're not abandoned or there's a tree. There's a, you know, you're in a beautiful park, um, whatever, if they could see with the phone. And so I thought, well, maybe someday, you know, who knows? And, and then IBM M came out with their Watson build challenge. And when we, uh, during that, um, we progressed through my company, Kil excuse me, Kilroy Blockchain, we progressed through the different steps of the Watson Build Challenge um, and uh, proposing to, to make this. And during the process, we, we were challenged by the IBM engineers, okay, Kilroy Blockchain, what's this AI app got to do with blockchain? And so we started really thinking about it. And we realized that the data, you know, if the, if the data uh, is what feeds AI and you're, you're a blind or visually impaired person, you know, you need to rely on this data with, you know, critical data, you know, this is no light thing. You know, we don't want anybody tampering with it. So I thought, well, that would be where you use blockchain. And so I brought that out to some engineers and, and they said, you know what, if you data you think that's important with data also think about the algorithms so basically we opened an entire can of worms and realized that there was nothing that was securing ai and uh you, know, you can even go so far as to reverse ai as long as you have a tamper evident audit trail which is what this group brings to the table um so um uh, i also want to address identity for a second um Identity is something that that is brought to the table by blockchain as well. And then also you can interface with certificate authorities that support C2PA. So then that can be an end-to-end -end solution where you've got the same, uh, you've got the same certificates and the uh and the uh uh, uh, blockchain uh, uh, is all based on stuff from the certificate authority. So, you know, there's ways to tie those things together. Um, distributing tamper evident uh, verification is control too. You know, there's nothing that does that like blockchain, right? We all know that. And uh, yeah, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, control three, governing, instructing, and inhibiting intelligent agents. This is after they become released into the wild. And uh, in, in my book, Blockchain Tethered AI, you know, you'll find detailed instructions and in code that tells you how to, uh, how to begin an AI project responsibly. Um, you know, the things to think about, the, the way to keep the origin itself of the project from drifting. Uh, you know, if you, if you uh, create a, an AI to pick uh, dead chickens out of a, uh, out of a, a, a pen, which is something that has actually been suggested to me. And then you, and, but then that drifts and all of a sudden now you're killing chickens that are almost dead. That needs to be declared somewhere so you can back it up. And, uh, you know, that, that's an extreme example, but there's, you know, that applies to everything. Uh, you also need to know how you're governed how you're governing, what your process is for governing your AI system and governance. Hello, blockchain, trust networks. You know, it's like, it's like the, the old the ad where uh, some of you might be old enough to remember. I doubt it, but the, you had the, the peanut butter in my chocolate where the, the guy, it was a Reese's peanut butter cup and the guy would walk out with the, with the chocolate and the other guy would have the peanut butter and they'd be bumping into each other. And then all of a sudden they got peanut butter and chocolate. And they say that's how the Reese's cup was invented. But this is, you know, we're the Reese's cup of content credentials, right? We have all that back end, all that tooling that, that the people that have been working on things like news provenance for years and years, they need us and they don't really know it yet. Um, so it's good time for us to rise up to that challenge and uh, inhibiting intelligent agents. Uh, it, for instance, like it, let's say uh, you have a rogue AI, you have to have a way to bring that back into your governance process and to, and to uh, so it's into the workflow with the engineers. So everything is all trackable, traceable. What happened? What was the complaint? What the engineers do to address it? What was the training data and the algorithms? And how do we trace those? So every one of those is, a, is an opportunity for blockchain. Uh, and, and showing the authenticity through user view, viewable provenance. This is where you would put a trust logo on a, on a, on a, on a, on a model 
um, that goes along with its data sheet. And you would tell it, you know, here's how you can prove that of the provenance of this model. Um, and paying for training data is a badge of honor. Adobe, I hear them say it often, you know, all our training data for Firefly is paid for. We've paid everyone. And, and that's a badge of honor, and that's an up and coming badge of honor. And Orson, would you like to, to speak on any, all of this for a minute? The, the, what you just said, the last point was that badge of honor with the, with the content logo or the credentials logo. That is a valuable thing because that gives the, the, the household a good housekeeping seal of approval from years ago for those that are on here that understand what that is. That gives a seal of approval. That gives the, 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 the main reason that we need to have that and uh, what we're talking about today with the definitely the the user viewable provenance that's going to be a big thing with the type of things that will go along with this the finance and the mortgage industry to, uh, in the fintech yes and i'm going to also um take that one step further um, and invite you to use your imagination for a minute you might even want to uh, close your eyes because we're going to go into the future, 100 years. And what we're going to think about is typing something into an AI and having an output. And now who's getting paid? Who's getting paid for this stuff that it's been accumulating for the last 100 years? And the question is, Probably, it's probably nobody, probably that person is long dead, even if they ever got paid in the first place. So that's where you can come in, where there's huge opportunities to create new products that provide futures for AI. And I don't know if anyone um, has ever heard of Bowie Bonds. And uh, uh, Bowie Bonds were created by David Bowie's manager, uh, Bill Zisplatt. Uh, back when, see, David Bowie, his first manager just cleaned him out. So he was really famous at the end of the 1970s and penniless. So he had to carry on this image and he was completely broke. And so uh, he met a new, new group of people that said, look, you know, these songs have future potential. They're strong. Let's, let's, let's sell futures so you can get back to living your life and we can get on with your music catalog. Imagine what would have happened. Imagine how music in general, the whole thing would be different if his manager hadn't come up with that idea. So, so, uh, so we're in the same boat here. When someone, let's say a veteran tells a war story or Orson tells me, boy, you sure have some great stories. Boy, you've got stories about everything. You should sell your, your stories. But you know, what am I gonna sell? On? How much am I selling them for? And how long can this company use them? And then what happens after that? And, and, and it's not just my stories. You know, let's say that I'm a famous actress, right? I might be a really market, marketable hot property. Well, the thing that's going to be is they're going to want to make me stay young. Hello, you know, like they're not going to let me act other than when I'm at my prime. So how do I get paid? How do I get paid for my image? And how do my, uh, how do my, uh, how do I develop wealth for my family? and generations to come while my image continues to be used. And so Orson, do you wanna to add to that? Well, the, that's what we're looking at right now is, and we've seen so many things from legislations that's put in place to protect uh, name, image, likeness, voice. Uh, we've seen George Carlin's uh, image utilized in the, a lawsuit recently that was settled because of this, but I, I think you're on the, the way that you're sharing and some of the things that I've seen in the chat, uh, some of the comments in the chat here, we have to deal with this now as, and be a responsible companies or be responsible companies to utilize how we can add the protections and the provenance to give the consumers the, the confidence that this is not something that is fake or deep fake, et cetera. And we have to do that. And we're able to do that right now, as you're talking about in this presentation and working with some of the partners that we work with. Yes. And so, you know, I would conclude by, I'd like to show you my shirt that I wore for this today. Slow your roll. 
and oddly enough, I've heard this phrase bunches of times this week. And, um, but I would say that to you because the AI, the companies, you've seen them all talk about, oh, well, let's stop, let's stop. Up. it's like what a joke you know anybody who's ever played tag on the playground knows that that's a, a lie and so so what you want to do instead is you want to be forward thinking you want to come up with with financial products and instruments that can be used so let's say someone uh puts a story out for training data um uh or or their voice or their likeness there should be a way where they can walk out with money and and go get themselves something to eat go get themselves a place to stay and and there's there there's probably going to have to be financial instruments that support that and they need to be trackable and traceable it needs to be red flagged if anyone takes a cut it needs to be red flagged if the shell game is played with the money and it doesn't end up in the hands of the the people so with that i'd like to conclude orson did you have anything else to add to that you no, know, I just really want to thank uh, Marvin and James, and especially Brett Hyperledge for allowing us to make this presentation. And uh, any questions, I think you put our contact information below. Please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we want to work with this responsibly, and we want to make people feel good about the, the potentials of what AI and blockchain can do and how it can benefit us, as well as users and the consumers that we're, want, that we're talking about that this can work for. Thank you. And, and just a suggestion, you can subscribe to our service at file.baby. And what that would bring you is uh, that's the C2PA platform that we've built. And it would just bring you, you know, it would cut a lot of time off of, of your uh, learning curve to uh, to get on the C C2PA bandwagon. And then you can figure out, okay, here's how I would interface this with blockchain. So uh, I'm gonna uh, open this up for questions. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Karen. Uh, thank you, Orson. Uh, excellent yeah. presentation. Um, I, I read your book. It, it was an, an excellent read. And as I was going through what I really appreciated in the book, were the examples that you guys went through and it had a lot of diagrams. I'm a visual guy, I need to see pictures. So th that was awesome. Um, you walked through the four blockchain controls and as you were going through those examples, uh, is there any one of those blockchain controls that you think is more important or more effective or more effective than the others, especially for our industry, for mortgages or financial services in general? That's a good question. You know, identity is critical. Uh, and, uh, you know, having a good way to interface and identity is something that's that's pluggable. Yeah. So there's all kinds of efforts for identity going around. Like, for instance, when uh, LinkedIn verifies my identity, they do it through the university where I'm a student. So, you know, they go to somebody who's seen me. I mean, the university knows who I am. And so the the uh, the, my LinkedIn says I'm verified because of that. So, so there's, um, you know, many, many, there's probably hundreds of identity systems that are going on out there. So one of the things would be able to uh, develop standards uh, to plug these in. Another thing you could really do is uh, participate in C2PA. And uh, I recommend that to anybody who wants to. And if somebody wants to come in and see what it's like, you can volunteer through Friends of Justin, uh, which is our nonprofit. And then we can take you to a meeting and you can uh, you can participate and see what it's like. And, and you can even keep volunteering through Friends of Justin if you want. Um, but uh, you know, then also too, you can join with your own organization. It's really an awesome group. They, they're, they're hustling on these standards. And, uh, and so there, we really don't have like a mortgage subgroup. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it would be excellent to have a mortgage subgroup. So I would say, you know, please, uh, Marvin and uh, everyone, I'd like to see you, you know, in C2PA and reach out to Orson or me if you would like to volunteer and, and, and come to a meeting and we can get you a schedule. There's meetings all week about all the subtopics. And my, my particular uh, 
a task force is a trustless task force um, where we're uh, developing uh, standards for uh, certificate products along with the certificate authorities that then can plug in. So, you know, the timing is perfect. If you have a group of, of, of mortgage providers or, and lenders that are using blockchain network, this is the perfect time to come in and say, here's what we need. Right and, right. and start getting in those conversations. Okay. Excellent. Marvin, I wanted to add to the, the follow up on what your question was. I think that the controls, definitely the controls one and two of what can, can you slide, put that back there, your controls on the um, four controls? Definitely is what Karen said, the, the identity. But you, I think. Uh, all of these were very, very pertinent, but I got to tell you, one and two uh, would be really almost in that order because that's some of the things that you want to give the the background and the history, and as well as the uh, you can speak very boldly that someone knows that you have those in place uh, with blockchain. I think that can go a long way in this industry, and uh, I think there's something for us to build off of what just Karen just said. We can create what we need to for this industry. We can do it and work with you all to, to do that. Yeah, we're available yeah. to do that. And um, the, uh, see, you said something that triggered something for me. Um, oh, the source of, of the data. Uh, here's an example for the lending industry. Um, let's say that there's an accusation that uh, a biased decision was made on, on lending. Right. And and let's say, for instance, you've gone to great lengths to make sure that you're not using bias training data. And, and by biased, I mean, you know, my women and minorities have been overlooked for the last 50 years. And so you're going to base it on that. And the AI will make those same decisions. Right. Because it's garbage in, garbage out. So you want to be able to prove that you're not doing that. And so, so this is a way that you could actually prove the, the source of all of your training data. You know, this is not based on bad loans and, and officers that got fired. This is based on the high road and what we want to see as an organization. And here, you don't even have to ask me twice. Here's the link uh, and you can track it back yourself. You know, Thank just you. That, that's an excellent example because that there's a whole series of regulations uh, applied to the mortgage industry to counteract in that exact example. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Sure, you're welcome. You know, just a, a couple of observations. So Karen Orson, I think you're right on the money. Actually, last month, we our presentation was about digital identities and some of the efforts that are being put into the financial industry. You know, as an observation, it's interesting as, you know, listening you present, especially Control 4, when we talk about showing authenticity through user viewable provenance, you know, the first thing it makes me think of is the blue check mark on, you know, X formerly Twitter, they love to say. Um, and, you know, when that initially came out, people saw a lot of value and evidence. Well, as we've seen over the years, some things have changed and different owners have come into power and things have changed again. And so now it kind of makes that, okay, is that blue check mark as trustworthy as what we used to th think about it? What I like about this concept is you've got that user viewable provenance. So it's not just seeing that blue check mark, it's being able to understand and be able to view, okay, what's the actual history of it? So that now I've got the comfort level that it's approved. I'm not relying on somebody in a glass tower that's getting paid and saying, okay, I'll give you a blue check mark because I believe it is uh, you. So um, just a, you know, an observation along the way. Yes, James, and it's also, uh... If you think about it, that uh, different groups can trust different sources, too. Right, right. So you know, it's just this is really what happened. That's this yeah. is our, you know, this is our uh, audit trail. So yeah. <laughs> Any more questions or comments? I think um, we're I, probably pretty close, huh? Yeah, I think we still have a, a couple of minutes because I, I do have a couple other questions. Um, now, as those four controls are being executed uh, for blockchain tethered AI, where should the output from those controls be stored? 
because I assume they're not going to be stored on the same blockchain. And, and then kind of a related question at the very beginning of your book, you said that all of this was based on Hyperledger Fabric. And my second kind of question is, why was Hyperledger Fabric chosen? And I assume that all of this is still applicable to other blockchains, that you're blockchain agnostic. Okay. Um, well, first of all, the, re, uh, the you're probably going to have to ask me the first question again, as my brain is not that big. My buffer is shorter than that. <laughs> uh, my first question, where should the output from the four controls be stored? The output from the four controls is we we have it stored in a special blockchain tethered AI system that's built for that that handles the the machine learning workflow. Okay. And 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 so you have the uh, AI engineer, you have the uh, you have the uh, machine learning ops ML ops. Right. And then you have stakeholders. And so that's, you know, that's kind of the major workflow. And then after, after the model is trained and deployed, then you have the public. So there needs to be some kind of a special system for that. Now it could be, you might be using something like Microsoft Responsible AI that handles a lot of these workflow items. And then you want to API your blockchain in, you know, because all this right. is caught on. Every bit of it is caught on as far as uh, the workflow and the steps and and you can't just turn things loose. And I believe in Microsoft Responsible AI, they've already got C2PA integrated. Oh, OK. So uh, so that uh, is a big deal uh, in the reactor series of the Microsoft uh, training. Uh, there is a video not this current one, but the previous one, I believe that talks about C2PA. And I have not seen it, but that's what they told me. And so, um, but, uh, you know, I would say think, it, you know, uh, platforms that are built for responsible AI yep. with blockchain integrated. Okay. And okay. so, so that's kind of how it is. Yeah. So like your financial stuff would probably stay on its own blockchain. Right. Um, this would be you would set and, and you might even set up integrated blockchains for training data provenance and stuff but but yeah the the basic i think the to answer your question i think it's yeah it's just it's its own system so what what was your next question i can't remember uh, why was fiber uh, hyperledger fabric chosen in because there there are so many blockchains and we're always stressing interoperability because my company built this all uh, at, we built the examples for my book, Blockchain Tethered AI, which I don't know where I laid it. Oh, here it is. Uh, Kilroy Blockchain built all these examples, and um, and we're we're a Hyperledger Fabric Shop. Yep. You know, at the time, so that was okay. you know, we've built things like a 1031 transfer mm -hmm. uh, app, uh, blockchain tethered uh, application, and you know I have that still in the can if anybody's interested. Um, and we also built a, uh, a closing, something for closings that does, uh, does the, uh, the blockchain mm -hmm. uh, audit trail. And so uh, any of those could have AI integrated with them and you'd have an instant blockchain tethered AI uh, lending uh, industry application. 1031s are probably a pretty big deal too. That, that could oh, open yeah. Yeah, business. 1031 exchanges, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And 1031 exchange for anybody that's not familiar with that, that's when that's an IRS uh, law that lets you, uh, when you make a profit off of a property, it lets you transfer that, uh, that amount to another, transfer your profit to another property within certain guidelines and certain timeframes. And as long as you do it right, then you don't pay taxes on that property money that you made and it's like a tax deferral thing and it's really it gets complex but uh but what blockchain can bring to it is that audit trail then that you show you can show the irs and say this really happened yeah okay. yeah well, that's, uh, we've got that built so yep <laughs> okay. uh, i showed that we have uh, only one minute left um if any of the uh, participants has a, a question for Karen or Orson. I know I've kind of been monopolizing things as I tend to do. So I, I want to open it up if anyone has uh, uh, one last question. 
Okay, um, we're at the top of the hour. I, you shared your contact information, Karen and Orson. Thank you very much. The, this has been very interesting. And, and yeah, definitely order the book. I, I read it. it. It was a great read. Uh, but then, you know, I, I tend to dive into these things. Um, and it was very educational in terms of how to manage AI. So highly recommend it. Karen or some, I'd like to uh, reach out to you later on and, and talk about some of those other blockchain applications Certainly. that you just mentioned. Thank have you a, so much. Thank you all. Have a great okay. day. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you very Thank much, you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you so man. much. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.